I am Danielle Parody, and this is The Place That Thaws, a six-part podcast series about life in the Arctic and the way that climate change is changing the lives of the people who live there. I know. <laughs> that is the sound of a hungry sled dog. Down. <laughs> I'm with Devin Manick, a 22-year-old dog sledder. Resolute Bay used to have at least 15 dog sled teams. Today, he's the only game in town. I started off with one dog and then German Shepherd, and then another dog. Um, but that was like kind of the beginning. And then I got two Inuit sled dogs after that. And from there I started from scratch, basically. And I raised them to adults. And, and then they bred. And then I just kept going from there. Devin is tall and lean and very active. One of the first things he tells me is that he might smell like rotten seal meat. He had been cleaning out his boat for the winter. Nice truck. Right? Devin just got a new-to-him truck, and his favorite thing to do, besides hunting and taking care of his dogs, is to drive around listening to music and singing along. I love this song so much. Yeah, we'll feed the puppies first and then we'll go feed the dogs after. We drive up to the shed where the grown dogs are tethered. The sun has set hours ago and the moon is out. There's just the faintest touch of light on the horizon. The shed is multicolored. It looks like it was red, then painted blue, and then the snowy winds scraped off the latest coat of paint. Arctic sandblasting. Watch my back for bears. Devin is wearing a headlamp so he can see. Watch your back, just in case there's bears. Yeah. I don't see any. Oh, they like come out of nowhere. So. Did they? I guess they would, huh? Not to scare you. <laughs> no, no, I was already walking through town and I was thinking about that. Thinking about the polar bears. <laughs> Inside the shed is a bright red meat with black skin. It all looks very similar to me, but there's a mixture of 80% narwhal, a walrus, and a touch of seal meat. <laughs> Can you tell me about the sleds while we're here? I'm looking at them. So they're wood? Yeah, so they're all handmade by me. You make them by hand? Yep. Uh, most of them are wood. This is my biggest one. It's four feet by 13 feet. That's like big for a dog sled. Yeah. But like a snowmobile, it's just kind of small. Mm -hmm. But the dog is nice and big. And this one's I think 14 feet long and three feet wide. And then the, like, the ski parts are made of aluminum. Wow. Yeah. And I made that with a friend because we were dog sledding in pairs where we split my team up. Yeah. We did two teams and he brought one of his dogs. We were even. And yeah, we did a musk ox hunt trip. The musk ox is an ice age survivor. It took us five days to hold in my hotel in Resolute South Camp, there's a taxidermy of one of them in a meeting room. Like its extinct cousin, the woolly mammoth, the musk ox is fuzzy. It's a dark brown to beige coat. Its horns curve to frame its face like a 1970s model. It's twiggy, but with an even more elaborate fur coat. Having escaped the Ice Age, the muskox are just hoping they remain alive in the world of hoofed mammalian high fashion. The Morris Animal Foundation found that due to climate gentrification, 
herd sizes have dropped by 80% in the last decade. Devin's musk ox trip took five days. He carries gear up to 1,500 pounds. Yeah, it all depends on how far you're going. The longer you go, the more food you have to bring for yourself and the dogs and more fuel, which right. makes more weight. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is my, like, my, my strongest sled. Like, I built it to be unbreakable. How so, did you learn to build them? Uh, so, during, when I was 16, there was an Arctic College course and they needed somebody to film it. And um, so they asked me because I had, like, a camera. Wow. And so I filmed it, and then they had one more slot open, so they asked me if I wanted to build one, so I built one. And it was Roger so living up that taught it, and Simon Deloat, and Tabitha Mullen, and they, they taught me how to make one. Awesome. And then around the same time, I started dog sitting, so I built a little dog sled, and then I built another one, and it just kept, you know, making more. And now I just build them like it's candy. <laughs> he also has his grandparents' sled lined up. And those ones are my grandparents. Your grandparents' sled? Yeah. Oh. The antiques? Ah, uh, not really. Oh, okay. My, gra- my grandpa built them like three years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, actually, one of them's like 20 years old. It was at, it was, he left it at a camp, and me and my uncle brought it this spring. And then when I brought it back, my grandpa repaired it, and it's been working again. <laughs> it's like 20 years old. Um, I can't really tell which one's the 20 year old one and which one's the new one. Things kind of get weathered here, Far over there. Oh, okay, over back over there. With all the oil on it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Cool. As a person in his 20s, Devin has more at stake than his older relatives when it comes to climate change. By the time Devin is 35, the Arctic Ocean may have open northern waters for months at a time, even if we manage to scale back our greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of people his age are worried about what is coming. A study in The Lancet looked at the growing anxiety about climate change in young people. The study reviewed responses from 10,000 youth. 59% said they were very worried about climate change, and 83% of respondents said that they think people have failed to take care of the planet. Devon is a meeting place between the past and the future. Climate change isn't something that he talks about a lot, but it affects his life. As a young person, he's going to experience even more effects than someone who's an elder millennial. He also told me off mic that he was really concerned about climate change when he was younger, but thinks that the media does a lot to scare people, and he now tries to focus on his ability to adapt. Back inside, we talk about the work that he does. So I, I do like dog sled tours, um, boating trips. Like this summer, we had a, a film crew um, filming belugas, mm-hmm. and they spent a month, month with us at a camp. So I'm like the guy on the ground for bringing food and setting up camp for you know film crews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then yeah, so I, I started off with dog dog sledding when I was a kid, and I realized you know. I kind of want to do this, so I decided, you know, why don't I just make money taking people out? Mm-hmm. Then I'd be my main job. Another job I do is I work for QIA as a guardian, mm-hmm. uh, Kikatani Inu Association, Nautil So they have a new marine protected area, mm-hmm. the Didalitup Imanga. Yeah. Um, Can you say that again? Didalitup Imanga. Uh, so Devon Island is Didaliti, and it looks like chin tattoos, the mountains. Like those lines? Yeah. So that's why they call it that. Oh. And it's called the Dilitup, the Devon Island waters. And it's like a lot of animals live around there. So they protected the area and they got, they got a whole bunch of money. So they decided to hire these guys to like monitor the, the waters, um, harvest food and animals for the communities. So I, I started off with that and now i um, carrying over to it. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, now I'm full time with them, mm-hmm. and I, you know, we 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 do other things like some outreach and um, taking like school kids out on a school trip, or teaching them how to build a sled. What's the protected area look like? It's huge. Mm-hmm. So it, like spans from Grease Fjord to Resolute to Clyde River, Pine Inlet, Archie Bay, 
all, all that water. Um, it was going to be smaller at first, but they talked to the communities and they made it bigger. They could have even made it even more bigger, but but we have what we have now and it's really good. Um, you know, lots of animals overwinter that way because it doesn't freeze in the winter. So in the summertime, all of the marine mammals like seals, walruses, whales like narwhal beluga, bowhead whales, they all come like farther this way in the in the summer. And then they go back out that way in the winter. And they go all the way from Lancaster Sound into Baffin Bay. The Talarita Bamunga is an area nearly the size of New Brunswick. The area is a joint effort at conservation between the Inuit and the federal government. Tuwaijuituk is a marine protected area created by the federal government in 2019. It is located in Canada's high Arctic basin, off of the northwest coast of Ellesmere Island. Because of the climate crisis, it will be the last place in the north to have summer ice by 2050. Inuit have been working towards more control over land management in the north. This also gives the ability to employ Inuit for cultural and community services. The Kikatani Inuit Association supports Inuit-led activities like monitoring ecological health, maintaining cultural sites, and promoting intergenerational sharing of Indigenous knowledge. Here's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau speaking about climate change in the north in Arctic Bay, Nunavut, in 2019. Just two weeks ago, it was warmer in Ellesmere Island, one of Canada's northernmost areas, than in Victoria, BC. There is no question that the climate crisis is changing the face of the Arctic as we know it. Populations of belugas, narwhals, walruses, seals, polar bears, and thousands of other species who depend on year-round sea ice to survive are now migrating, dwindling, are in some cases disappearing. As to the effects of climate change, you see them everywhere, in little ways that add up to big changes. Back at Devon's shed, I am on polar bear watch. And while I look out for the polar bears, Devin uses an axe to chop the meat into pieces to feed the puppies. In my head, I'm thinking back to some stories that Peter Amarolik told me about how some clever polar bears learn to cover their nose so you can't spot their trademark black eyes and nose in the dark. Polar bears and Inuit have a symbiotic relationship. Like humans, polar bears are at the top of the food chain as meat eaters. Melting sea ice brings bears to the shore more often, and the smell of garbage is a tempting lure to the local dumps. People here burn their garbage at the dump site to keep bears away, but several bears I've spotted are covered in soot from digging for tasty morsels anyway. I had one eat my dog before, so that traumatized me, so I get very anxious this time of year. Polar bears in this area belong to the Lancaster Sound subpopulation. This population's health is considered uncertain. The last survey reported 2,541 animals in this region. According to the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF, the opening of the ocean means higher productivity, more algae, zooplankton, fish and seals, and better hunting opportunities for polar bears. But the warming climate also means that there are fewer opportunities for sled dogs in the Arctic, even up in Resolute. Here in late October, there's enough snow for a sled, but the weather and ice are unpredictable. The World Wildlife Foundation in a 2020 post online said, 
scientists found that recovery efforts are paying off and the bears have, at least temporarily, responded well to changes in Arctic sea ice. This is reflected in their body conditions. Bears are fatter than they were in the mid to late 1990s and increasing or stable in population over the past two decades. So the issues for the bears in the high Arctic are not the same as what we see further south where some stranded bears are starving. Still, spending more time on shore is unhealthy for the bears and it leads to lower birth rates. Here, the community has learned to coexist with the bears and monitors the population. That's my oldest dog there. She's a Greenland dog. Her name is Aku. Aku. Short for Aku Pito. And that's what we call people from Greenland. She's 11. 11? Wow, that's old. And she still keeps up. <laughs> She's got the knowledge. Devin's grandparents lived in an even more remote area than Resolute, so they were not around for the story I'm going to talk about next. As Devin keeps the tradition of dog sleds alive, he both teaches others and learns about the legacy of the Kimmet. Kimmet means dog in Inuktitut. One of these lessons is the sad story of why they aren't so common anymore. Beginning in the late 1990s, a number of Inuit publicly accused the RCMP of killing sled dogs under government orders to limit Inuit mobility. The RCMP did an investigation, but did not find evidence of a government conspiracy. That said, the Kikitani Truth Commission, which was set up to look into the complaints, felt that the RCMP investigation was too focused on the idea of a government conspiracy and didn't consider factors such as the way killing sled dogs affected the livelihood of the Inuit. From the report... The killing of Kimmet has become a flashpoint in Inuit memories of the changes imposed on their lives by outsiders and the challenges to their independence, self-reliance, and identity as hunters and providers. It contributed to the hardships and hunger they faced in the settlement. Jodemi Amagolik, a local hunter, talked to us about the killing of the Kimmet. I remember going on to talk to my dad Snow machines, TV, internet. Best thing that ever happened to us, internet. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the dog sleds then. So you remember them when you were little? Yep, because we moved here when, we were, when I was 12 years, two years old. And we lived in the old village down there. And there used to be maybe about 15 dog teams all in front of our community. And there were about 10 to 15 dogs per dog team. And so I remember them quite well. They used to make lots of noise. <laughs> now this is the one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was devastating to the whole community when RCMP started shooting all the dogs, eh? Yeah. That basically wiped the spirit out of the community and we became welfare people, I guess. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. You said it wiped the spirit out of the community. Well, a lot of these hunters were, they raised a dog team right from little to adulthood and they taught them how to be part of a team and stuff like that. After you do that, you're part of them, eh? You basically treat them like family. The way they did killing of the dogs were they didn't even tell the dog owner. They'd go right in front of the where the dog teams are to start shooting and shooting them. Eh? The hunter would go out surprised, try to stop them but couldn't because RCMP were really feared that time. Eh? So 
after they wiped out a whole, gee, must have been about 60, 70 dogs they wiped out. And after that, they were, the community really struggled to survive. Because dog teams were the only way to go hunting, eh? And yes, you could see that there's no real walking because of the dark season and cold. Polar bears. And yeah, polar bears. <laughs> Now, I'm back with Devin and his friend, Divyesh Purohit. Divyesh is trying to buy a walrus tusk for his father, who lives in Saskatchewan. I work for a company called Nav Canada. So we do maintenance, um, like a preventive maintenance and troubleshooting of all the communication, navigation systems used by the air traffic controllers and the pilots. And you've been here seven months. Yes, uh, almost uh, seven and a half months. I came here mid-March uh, this year, and I'm going on this 27th back home. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Like, pretty, you could probably just take these, but I'd rather get a permit. The wildlife officer is not in her office, so we think she may be out on patrol. Since it is cold and snowy when I'm here, I ask some questions about the summer. Like, I call it Mars sometimes. I guess some of the people that relocated, they said they felt like they'd been dropped on the moon. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I don't know how I can live here. <laughs> I guess I, I still do. You make it work, I guess. Yeah. But it's, it's all made up of limestone. And all that limestone drains into the ocean. So that's why I can't hold any water and that's why plants can't really grow. Uh -huh. um, but in turn, it makes it like... There's a lot of nutrients in the ocean, so there's lots of marine life. I saw some flowers in the summer, like, um, I don't know what are those called, Devon. Which one? Um, the yellow, yellow ones. Uh, the Arctic poppy. Arctic poppy, is okay. Or Cornwallis Island and, poppy. And the one that you have, you made me eat, those flowers. What are those? The purple one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what, what are they called? Yeah. It's a purple saxifrage. Oh. Yeah. And then I made, did I make you eat those sour ones? No. Okay, that's a uh, mountain sorrel, and they have they taste like green apples. Mm. And now we're driving out of Resolute. Yeah. Where are we going? Oh, we're heading to Allen Bay. And there's whole, there was a whole bunch of whale carcasses from the summer fall hunt. Yeah. The bears are feeding on them, so and the wildlife officer just goes to check them out. You have noticed you get in a car with someone here, and they try and drive you out to Allen Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm looking for her. I know. Like, I don't really... As we drive down the road toward Allen Bay, there's an array of colors in the sky, and we're all really taken by the beauty. There's so many different shades of blue, and the space is so vast, it's hard to capture in photos. The sky has layers upon layers of color. <laughs> oh, look at this. This is beautiful. Yeah. Look at all these colors. Oh, it's so nice. So we have blue, white, it's like the ocean's freezing too. And the purple. I can't wait till it freezes. Can okay, you I'm gonna take a quick picture outside. I don't see any polar bears. So. That one thing I noticed here is what you see from the eyes. I, I took so many pictures yeah. and then I, I still cannot justify what I saw yeah. in the pictures. Because it's so vast. It's so vast and what you see even with very large scale, I mean wide angle also. Yeah. Still, what you see, it's I cannot justify it. Yeah. <laughs> the beauty of it in the pictures. Like, I, I was just going through all my pictures for seven months, and I was like, but it was just, it just looked like some ice floating mm -hmm. in the ocean. Right. But when I saw it, it was different. <laughs> yeah. We drove past yeah. Allen Bay, so past the dump, and so up the to dump? the fenced in military no, dump, no, which is mostly <laughs> scrap metal. There's old cars from the 50s and other twisted metal. I don't see tab. No. We didn't find Tabitha, the wildlife officer, on our trip. So they ended up making the sale later. 
we did get another look at the Resolute Bay polar bears. They were fast. The way they were running, it was cute. Yeah, it was really <laughs> cute. <laughs> This beautiful place, vast and difficult to describe, is home to at least 170 people full-time. The symphony of sled dogs, the crunching of snow underfoot, the long periods of light and of darkness, it's all very different from the land most of us live on. And yet their ecosystem and lives are affected by the decisions we make about burning fossil fuels and causing the planet to warm up. Join us next time as we talk to someone who always knows what's going on around town, the postal worker. Plus, hear about how I got stuck in the snow so bad, a front loader had to pull me out. Hey, maybe it's a good time to be a girl and be stuck. No, you're taking us down with you. We lost a point. I'm making all women look bad <laughs> by coming to Resolute Bay and um, immediately driving into a snowbank. Mm. The Place That Thaws was written and recorded by me, Danielle Parody, produced by Mark Blackburn. You can find this and other APTN news podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast app you currently use. The title music is by Angela Amarola. Her song is about the springtime. All of the sources for the show can be found in our show notes. You can email me, dparadis, P-A-R-A-D-I-S, at aptn.ca. If you like this podcast, consider donating to support Indigenous news. Go to aptnnews.ca slash contribute. Hello, I'm Rick Harp, host of APTN News Brief, a daily podcast version of the nightly broadcast of APTN National News. Available on all major podcast platforms, APTN News Brief is your quick way to hear the headlines every weekday morning. Learn more at aptnnews.ca slash podcasts.